Modesty Blaze is the foremost burlesque artist in Britain today. And um, will you just look fantastic? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I know you have something really big in common with our previous speaker. You went to a convent. <laughs> yes, I, was, um, <clears throat> I went to an all-girls uh, Catholic convent school. So in the words of Mae West, I was Snow White, and then I drifted. And uh, I ticked all the cliché boxes when I left the convent school and became a stripper. Well, that's, that's a very good uh, progression. I'm sure, I'm sure Richard would, would much approve. Um, but tell me, what, what is a burlesque artist? Uh, it's fashionable now. What, what, what do you do? <laughs> well, it's been around for a long time. It's been around for 150 years. Um, and its roots are very much in Britain. Um, and uh, burlesque to put it briefly, is ironic cabaret. And burlesque is three things. It's uh, funny men, it's sexy women, and it's entertainment. Um, and as one of the old strippers said to me, the shtick is as important as the strip. What's the shtick? The shtick, well, it's the comedy. The root of the word burlesque is burla, which is to laugh. And um, its, its roots were really in satire. I mean, you could, go, you could take it back to the, the Greek satire um, and then coming up to, in Victorian times, uh, satirical plays, things that poked fun at um, things that happened in the news or, you know, played around with um, notions of class. It was a very middle-class entertainment in the Victorian times. Um, people think it was just for the lower classes. In fact, that was more musical that came, came along a little later. Uh, because you had these sort of very cheap variety acts. But burlesque was very middle class because you had to be middle class to understand the, uh, the cultural references. Um, and then, of course, it was the Americans who really introduced the striptease, which when we know and love today. When did they do that? Well, um, there are many Americans who will lay claim to having invented the striptease. Um, <laughs> Uh, mostly by accident that they were shimmying and one of their garments fell off. Um, <laughs> um, the Minskys popularized the striptease. What was happening was that you'd have these comedians traveling around the country um, and they'd take a, a woman with them to feed them the, the straight lines so that they could do their comedy skits. And to fill in the changes of scenery, uh, they would say, well, we have a woman with us, she's not doing anything. Let's put her in a gown, and she'd walk backwards and forwards and take off her clothes, and usually she couldn't dance. And that was really how the striptease part of the burlesque show was born. And that was around the 30s. And of course, at this time, you had, um, you know, people were sort of coming back from the ashes of the Depression, and they wanted escapism. And they wanted something glamorous. And even back then, people think, oh, you know, it was only the Rain Mac Brigade who went to a burlesque show. There was still, it was like a theatrical audience. There were still women in the, in the shows back then, like there are today. And about 65% of my audience now are female. And would they have looked like you, looked like that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this actually, no, they wouldn't have looked like this because um, my style is, I'm very inspired by showgirls and Liberace. So, actually, a classic burlesque uh, uh, style would have been uh, a gown, and it would have been, you know, beautiful evening wear and fox fur stoles, and they didn't really uh, wear this kind of extreme corsetry back then, but it's something that's become very popular today. Um, so, but we all have our different styles, because the whole point of being a burlesque performer is to have your very own developed persona. It looks unbelievably <laughs> uncomfortable, is it? Yes. <laughs> How small do you get your waist to? Um, well, normally, naturally, my waist is 27 inches, and I can take 7 inches off. And for that, that's 20 inches, but I have gone down to 19 inches. It hurts. <laughs> How long can you kind of uh, get around being 19 inches? <laughs> um, 20 minutes is about <laughs> my maximum threshold. <laughs> so, so tell me why burlesque has become fashionable now. I mean, it... it, it it, it's a strange thing to follow on from uh, the slight sort of 
you know, kind of strippers or heroin chic you were talking about, that you're such the opposite of all that? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I think people think it's suddenly become popular. But like everything, it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. And, you know, I've been doing this for 12 to 15 years now. Um, and, yes, in London, it became very popular in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, because women wanted to... Women didn't want to feel left out of um, an erotic form of entertainment. They didn't want to feel left out from something that was titillating and fun. Um, women love the shows. They want to feel glamorous. They want to look at something glamorous. They love the costumes. They want to come dressed up. They want to come in their finery and their feather boas and evening gowns and gloves and feel fabulous and whoop and cheer at other beautiful women. And in that sense, it's very supportive. The women are very supportive of the performers. Um, and I think that at the time, it was <clears throat> a contrast to um, in the early 2000s, we had this DJ culture and, you know, um, reality TV was becoming really popular. And this was the opposite of reality. Um, the whole idea of it was to um, put something out there that was slightly untouchable. Um, and that was something that, you know, I can't go down to... <sighs> Marks and Spencers and buy that, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, people wanted to see something that was slightly out of reach because everything had become so accessible. Um, so they wanted the live entertainment, they wanted the glamour, they wanted um, the humour. And much in the same way that uh, burlesque rose from the ashes of the Depression in the 30s, um, you know, we had a recession going on here as well. And um, people want something light-hearted that, that is poking fun at uh, our society and us and class and and it does that um, you know even the routines that we do they're ridiculous you know I roll around on the receiver of a six foot telephone it's ridiculous I can't yeah. take myself seriously when I'm doing that <laughs> why do you do that <laughs> well <laughs> that particular act um, was inspired by uh, the song Blondie, by Blondie hanging on the telephone. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hey, I'll make a giant six-foot telephone and um, get on the receiver and um, take my stockings off while the dial's spinning. And it was, it was kind of in the style of those old um, uh, film noir movies where there's this big moment of suspense where the murderer's on the phone or there's a missed phone call or there's a missed rendezvous. And so I did it in this whole film noir style and... And you, you write all your skits, or how do you describe them? Your acts, your shows, don't you? I do. Um, and, you, and you don't speak? No. So how do you... Can you Listen to my voice, this is why I don't speak on stage. I like your voice <laughs> very much. I don't know why you have a problem with it. But tell, tell me how, you communi how you'd communicate with something with the audience. <laughs> the well, audience. I just love that one can hold an audience without having to open one's mouth. And it's all body language. Um, and it is different from um, acting because you do break the fourth wall. Um, you make eye contact with people and just uh, look at someone while you're taking your bra strap down, which you wouldn't do as an actor. And you don't respond to the audience in the same way um, when you're playing the part in a play. Um, so, in that sense, um, it's much, it's, it's a different kind of performance. Um, but for me, I like the fact that without speaking, people can project some of their, a portion of their own fantasy. Um, I know that someone was really disappointed once in the audience to discover that I didn't sound like Gina Lollabrigida when I spoke. And they were expecting something very And uh, I disappointed. <laughs> Do you think it's, it's also partly about, you know, wanting to um, project, a, project a kind of fantasy because everything is so available now? I mean, you were saying earlier that how do you shock people anymore? I mean, Soho used to be shocking in a way, sexy and shocking, and it's, it's not, is it? Soho has changed incredibly, and I used to, when I first worked in film production and I spent a lot of time in Soho, and... Um, um, it's changed enormously, um, you know, 
you wouldn't go to Soho for vintage shopping like you do now or for a Starbucks. It, it, mm. it wasn't like that. It was loads of runners with cans of film and um, sort of red lights. And it was a completely different environment. And I responded, certainly, to the psychogeography of Soho when I started performing. Um, and, yeah, I think that... <laughs> There's that whole concept of the pendulum swinging and when um, when things become so accessible, you know, we have so much information available to us, everything's on the internet, everything's laid bare, we don't have the nudity regulations like we used to, um, you know, we have TV, we have every kind of entertainment available to us, every kind of information available to us. And with our sexuality, I think there's something of the charm that was lost with all of that accessibility. And I think people, when the pendulum swung completely this way, it's settling somewhere now um, in the middle where we can reclaim some of that allure and some of the mystique of femininity, or I should say femaleness. Um, and we're not going back to the days of internalizing everything and women should be seen and not heard and, you know, that's unhealthy. Um, but that there's some charm in mm -hmm. sexuality. And I think that when you hold something back and things are veiled, you get that frisson and the butterflies of the forbidden again, which you don't when things are always accessible all the time. So sometimes the most shocking thing you can do is keep your clothes on. And <laughs> in that sense, that's where burlesque, I think, has its appeal and its charm, and the tease is so alluring. And do guys try to pick you up a lot? <laughs> <coughs> no. <laughs> sure no, I the reason... <laughs> um, what I find is that men become strangely chivalrous, and suddenly they'll open doors and they'll pull chairs out and take my hand and kiss my hand, and but there's none of this, go on, love... And um, so that happens somewhere else, <laughs> <laughs> quite possibly. <laughs> but I, I think um, I, I, I do think I, th I think men quite enjoy that as well to have that kind of chivalrous behaviour. <laughs> I like to think so. <laughs> Where does what you do stack up with a kind of feminist world? In in what sense? Because it's a broad subject. I it's, am a feminist, but okay. Define being a feminist. In your, in your book. And, I mean, some people would say that you're back in a kind of, a woman who's been seen for sexuality and, and looks. Well, what I find really interesting is that I, people often bring up the word objectifying, and yet they'll never say that about a model in a magazine. Now, the thing about objectifying is reducing someone to an object that has no personality. But the point about burlesque is that you are very much a personality on stage. You are a developed persona. I'm in control of my career. I'm certainly not a victim. Um, burlesque is a form of entertainment like any other, like dancing or acting. Um, and for me, I don't know if I could simulate a sex scene for a film, um, but no one ever questions that. But they'll question burlesque. Um, but I'm very much in control of my sensuality, and I think it's ridiculous to say that to be a feminist would be to deny that we have mm -hmm. any sensuality or sexuality, because that's unhealthy. Um, I can control my sensuality and sexuality and have choices about how I want to present that, and that's how I square that with my job. And I'm just really interested in why no one ever uses that word objectifying about any other uh, form of entertainment that you could argue uh, women are being made more faceless. For example, modelling. Mm. Well, I, I'm not sure I entirely agree. I mean, I think a lot of modelling makes women rather faceless. I mean, that's much, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That is my point. Um, where can we go and see you? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> the next couple of months will be Nigeria. Zurich, Milan, and Rome. What are you going to do in Nigeria? <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking burlesque to Africa. Um. <laughs> Will you take lots of gowns? 
I'm doing a huge uh, lingerie show, um, and I will be performing uh, there, which I, I think is a first for Nigeria. I'll but, bet um, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, just before we end, do some more of the gestures that you might do for our audience, and then we can oh, give you a huge <laughs> round of applause, and thank you for coming. Uh, I suppose this is a cue for a bump and grind. <laughs> possibly, possibly a good cue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>